Good morning. You know, the farmer was looking up at the cloud one day, and sometimes you can see stuff in the clouds. And one day he was looking up at the clouds, and he could very distinctly see a G, and a P, and a C. And he was convinced that this was God speaking to him, God communicating to him, and GPC means go preach Christ. And so he was excited, and he ran down, and he told the uh, preacher, he told the elders, he told the deacons, God is calling me to go preach Christ. And he was so excited that uh, they decided to go, let, go ahead and let him preach the following Sunday. And so he got up, and uh, the following Sunday he got up and he preached, and... Uh, well, his lesson was uh, long-winded. It was incoherent. Uh, um, they couldn't tell exactly what the message was, and he kind of rambled on from one thing to the next. And uh, by the time he got done, neither he nor anyone else remembered or could tell exactly what it was that he said. And after he sat down, one of the deacons leaned over to him and said, You know, I think the GPC might have stood for Go Plant Corn. <laughs> and so, you know, I want to talk a little bit this morning about the call of God. And sometimes people talk... Talk about the call of God in so many different ways as something mysterious that come mysterious that comes to us, and we got to try and figure it out. But you know, as I look at all the ways that, that God called people throughout Scripture, when you are called by God, it is unmistakable. I mean, you, it's unmistakable. Think about Moses and the burning bush and those sorts of things. But as, as I think about God's call to us, I'm reminded of uh, passages such as a scripture reading this morning that reminds us that all of us have been called by God. All of us have been called by the gospel, called to a holy life, or called with a holy calling is how uh, some Bibles translate that. So all of us have been called by God. The question is not whether we have been called by God, but the question is whether I'm going to be faithful to what God has called me to. I want to go ahead and wrap up the sermon series that we've been doing this morning on elders and, um, and uh, talk about uh, discernment as to where... God has placed us in the body. See, part of figuring out uh, God's calling is not whether God's called us or not, but where do I fit in the body? What, in what way can I serve God? And particularly, I want to look at this particularly in uh, respect with the uh, appoint, uh, appointing elders uh, in the body. Is there any guidance that we have in Scripture on this? And the first point I want to look at this morning are the examples that we have of God's calling and his appointment to specific ministries in Scripture. And we have lots of examples of this in Scripture. If you want to go ahead and turn and read these passages with me, we're going to look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16, and this is where uh, God is looking for a man after his own heart to lead his people. And so he sends a Samuel to a certain man in the country to, uh, uh, to look at his sons. And one of his sons he's going to anoint to be the leader of uh, his people. So if you go down to 1 Samuel chapter 16 and look at verse 4, let's go ahead and read that paragraph. Samuel did what the Lord said and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the city came trembling to meet him and said, Do you come in peace? He said, In peace. I've come to sacrifice to the Lord, consecrate yourselves, and come with me to the sacrifice. And he also consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. And when they entered, he looked at Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. I don't know what Eliab looked like, but he must have been someone that just was impressive Surely the Lord's anointed. Maybe he had chiseled features. Maybe he was tall. Maybe he had a commanding appearance. But, verse 7, The Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab, and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Then Jesse made Shema pass by, and he said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are these all the children 
And he said, There remains yet the youngest. Behold, he is tending the sheep. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, with beautiful eyes, and a handsome appearance. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. And so now they bring in the youngest one, the, the one that wasn't even considered. It said he had, he, was a, he had a beautiful face. Can you think of a, a young boy who is out uh, tending the sheep? He has a, a nice uh, sun-tanned appearance, but he's young, and he's probably not something you would think of as uh, a kingly material. But that's the one that God chooses. And so after praying, after praying, God guides Samuel to David and anointed him. And so begins the dynasty of David, of kings in Israel. Go to Luke chapter 6 with me. We're going to look at a couple more of these. Luke chapter 6, beginning with verse 12. Jesus had been ministering. He'd been preaching the gospel. He'd been preaching the coming of the kingdom of heaven. And now at this point, he's going to choose 12 of those people that have been following him around. And he's going to call them apostles, people that he's going to uh, endow with special authority. An apostle is someone that has been given uh, official authority. So he's going to choose 12 of them. And if you notice, in Luke chapter 6 and verse 12, at this time, it says, He went off to the mountain to pray, and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples to him and chose twelve of them, whom he also named as apostles. And then, then he gives their names. And so Jesus spends all night in prayer. This is a big decision he's about to make. The Son of God spends all night in prayer. And the following day, he chooses twelve to be his uh, apostles. And so, uh, once again, like Samuel, there's prayers involved, and then there's the selection. Um, the, uh, the, the choice isn't man's choice. It isn't based on popularity. It isn't based on looks. It isn't based on any of those things. But ultimately, the choice belongs to the Lord. And even when they lost Judas, when he went and betrayed the Lord and he hung himself, first chapter of Acts, they said, we need to choose someone. There has to be 12 that goes out and, and, and are witnesses to, uh, to Christ and his resurrection, someone that's been with us from the very beginning up until now. And there were two guys among them. Both of them fit that bill, and they didn't know which one to choose. Both of them could have fit the bill, and so they wanted the choice not to be theirs and to be God's. And so once again, in Acts chapter 1, it says that they prayed, and then they casted lots, and the lot fell to a man by the name of Matthias. And we could talk about a lot of other people. Acts chapter 13, when it came time to set apart uh, Saul, who's also known as Paul, and Barnabas to go out and, and uh, take the gospel uh, uh, westward, it says that the Holy Spirit set the two of them apart. And the leaders of the church there prayed and fasted and laid their hands on them and commended them to the work. And then there's Moses, there's Aaron, there's Gideon, and all kinds of other people we have in Scripture. And what all of these have in common is a choice, ultimately, is God's choice, not man's choice. And when it comes to appointment, it always is associated with some kind of prayer. This reminds me of Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 4 which says, no one takes the honor to himself. No one takes the honor to himself, but receives it when he is called by God, even as Aaron was. Talking specifically about the high priest, but it goes for uh, other people that God appoints as well. We don't appoint ourselves. The choice is ultimately God's choice. I remember uh, when I was still uh, younger, a uh, friend of mine, uh, Gary, I remember I was telling him that uh, my desire to preach, and I wanted to preach. I love working with people. I love connecting with people. I love sharing the gospel, and I wanted to devote my life to that. And I still remember his question to me is, oh, when did you receive your calling? And I had no idea what he was talking about. What do you mean, receive my calling? And after a further discussion, I found out he was someone that believed that in order to reach out to people, in order to make your life's work, reaching people with the gospel, he believed that I had to have some sort of, anyone has to have some sort of audible call from God where, comes down, where God comes down and points his finger at you in some way and says, I choose you. Some sort of experience, you know, a burning bush or something like that. 
And, uh, and uh, so I, I considered that, but then I realized that, you know, God's calling doesn't always come that way. The scripture reading this morning reminds us that we have been called by the gospel. So the question is, how does God want me to serve him? Is there some particular focus? Is there some particular ministry that I can fit into and serve God in that way? Is God calling me to shepherd his sheep? And so I was considering what we have in the New Testament specifically about the appointing of uh, New Testament elders. No one takes the honor to himself but receives it when he's called by God, even as Aaron was. Do we see this principle in action in the New Testament? Well, go to Acts chapter 20 with me, if you would. Acts chapter 20. And this is uh, Paul as he's... Uh, gathered together all the elders from the city of Ephesus. He's on his way to Jerusalem, and it's kind of his uh, final words. He knows that they will never see each other again. He knows what's coming, and he knows that his death is likely imminent, and he'll never see these guys again. And if you notice uh, Acts chapter 20, uh, down in verse 28, he says to these elders, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which... Who? The Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Okay, God chose you. you. It wasn't man's choice. You didn't choose yourself. The Holy Spirit made you overseers. Go to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. Got several others we're going to look at. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. And uh, here's where he talks about how all the different parts of the body work together for the... Uh, uh, for the building up of the body, but I want you to notice in verse 11, um, actually, let's uh, start, with, uh, start with the beginning of the, <laughs> the long sentence. Let's go back to verse 7, and then we'll come down to verse 11. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now, this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also had descended into to the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also who, he who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. So this is talking about Christ, right? So Christ has ascended and now he's given gifts or ministries. And notice in verse 11 it says, And he gave some as apostles, <clears throat> some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers. And I want to highlight that word pastors. Okay, because sometimes we must understand pastors. You know what the word pastor means? The word means shepherd. And what we're talking about are shepherds, people that are shepherds of the flock. I am not a pastor. Sometimes when people misunderstand that. I'm not a pastor. Now, some of the things I do, I do a lead, <coughs> I do guide to the preaching of God's word. But when it comes to pastors, which are shepherds, uh, we're talking about somebody different. We're talking about the elders here. <coughs> and what I want to highlight here is the fact that who gave or who set these people apart to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, or shepherds of the flock? It was Jesus himself that did that. It's not man's choice. <coughs> so how do we square that with Titus, as we've seen in Titus chapter 1, it says, uh, I have left you in, where Paul tells Titus, I have left you in Crete, in Crete, in order to set in order what remains and appoint elders in all the cities. How do we scare, square that with the fact that uh, Timothy is tasked to lay his hands on people, not do it too hastily, but, it, but, but it lay his hands in order to appoint elders in the church in Ephesus? How do we square that with the fact that in Acts chapter 14, Paul and uh, Barnabas, after he was um, stoned and left for dead, went back to the cities that he was just at, and he appointed elders in all of the churches? If God sets apart people for this ministry... If the Holy Spirit has set apart them to be shepherds of the flock, if the choice is ultimately God's choice, then how do we square that with people like Paul and Barnabas and Timothy and Titus who were involved in appointing shepherds of the flock? This reminds me of uh, the, the young man that baptized me, a 16-year-old teenager, and he had a huge impact on me. I'll never forget his words after I came up out of the water. He told me, he didn't say, I saved you, but he said, God saved you using 
me. And I will never forget those words. He wanted to make sure that the glory and the attention went to God and not to himself because I really looked up to him. God saved you using me. It was a God thing. And I think a similar thing when it comes to appointing of God's leaders. God appointed David through Samuel who anointed him to be the next king over Israel. Jesus appointed 12 apostles after praying to God all night, and our Lord appointed them. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders after praying and fasting. Timothy and Titus used Tim the letters that Paul wrote to them, 1 Timothy and Titus. They used God's word to guide them in uh, the appointment of God's leaders and shepherds over his flock. Ultimately, the choice for who God's leaders are is a God thing. It's not based on popularity. It's not based on personal preference. It's not based on looks. It's not based on who has the nicest smile. It's not based on who I feel the best with. Have you ever noticed that when we come to a, a pointing of uh, God's leaders, uh, we don't have, a, don't have a, a lot of these examples of uh, nominations and campaigns and voting and things of that nature. Sometimes we think it's the first thing that we think of when it comes to that sort of thing. But I, have you ever noticed we don't have a lot of examples of that sort of thing in Scripture? And have you ever wondered why that is? Now, I've heard stories from other people that have done that way, and oftentimes it goes badly. Sometimes it gets ugly. Uh, somebody pointed out, you know, somebody could have been a Christian one week and another been a Christian all his life and they have the same pull through their vote. And then tell me if that makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, sometimes it can become a popularity contest. Sometimes there's campaigning going on. Feelings get hurt. People get mad. It sounds like a political campaign, doesn't it? And that's one of the poorest ways to do this sort of thing, and I don't think it's a biblical way either. That's why we have so many examples in Scripture of things like prayer and fasting, looking to God and looking to His guidance to give instructions for us. Sometimes the call of God can come through somebody like a Timothy, somebody like a Titus, somebody like a Paul or a Barnabas, or some other one of God's leaders that have already been appointed. The call of God may come through somebody like that who taps you on the shoulder and says, I think God may be calling you to the ministry of shepherding. That's the exact thing we see Timothy and Titus and Paul and Barnabas doing in their ministry. And so I'm going to spend uh, the remaining time here looking at the biblical perspective on how God places us. Turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 with me if you would. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Keep in mind that our place in the body how we serve God, that our calling is ultimately God's doing. The theme of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is uh, unity as the uh, body of Christ and our connection with one another. But I want you to go down to verse 4 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And notice, it says, There are varieties of gifts with the same Spirit and... There are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. Sometimes we call them gifts. Sometimes we call them ministries. Sometimes we call them effects or helps. Whatever we call them, the point he's making is that they all come from the same God. And if you go down to verse 11... It says, one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as He wills. Our place in the body is ultimately the work of God through the Spirit. That's probably why Paul said, the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to the Ephesian elders. Then in verse 15, it says, if the foot says, because I am not a hand... I'm not a part of the body. It is not for this reason any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, because I am not an eye, I am not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. 
whether I am an eye or an ear or a hand or a foot or a toe, this reminds us that it's God's doing. And no matter what part we are, no matter what ministry, no matter what function we have, we're no less a part of the body. All of us are important and precious to God. Verse 18 says, God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as He desired. So whatever ministry and whatever function, however my calling of God takes shape, it ultimately is God's doing. Now what if I wanted to be a hand? Instead I find myself on a foot. I don't want to be a, a foot. I want to be a hand. Or what if, I'm a, uh, what if I'm a hand and I wanted to be a foot the other way around? What then? I mean, what happens if God calls me and this is where I'm supposed to fit in and I decide this is not what I want to be? But the text says, because I am a foot and not a hand, I am not any less a part of the body. So I'm not going to pick up my ball and go elsewhere because this is not what I wanted to do. Now Jonah tried to do that. You remember Jonah? He said, I don't want to do this. God says, I want you to go preach over here to Nineveh. And Jonah said, I don't want to do this. And you remember what happened, right? He had a date with a fish, didn't he? A great big fish. And uh, he learned that when God calls that our job is to be faithful to God's call. So I can't say, well, God says I'm going to be a hand, but I don't want to be a hand. No, Jonah says don't do that, right? Jonah says don't do that. Let me use another illustration. In Romans chapter 9, it asks a question. Does not the potter have the right to do with the clay as he wishes? If you sit down at the potter's wheel... Have you, ever, have you ever worked with clay or maybe with Play-Doh or something like that? What does the clay do? Does the clay ever say, hey, what are you doing? Stop that. I don't want to be a pencil holder. I don't want to be a dish. I don't want to be a picture frame. I don't want to be an imprint of your child's hand. I don't want to do that. Does the clay? Clay never does that. And that's the point that the text is making. The potter has the right to do with the clay as he wishes. Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 8 says, Now, O Lord, you are our father, we are the clay, you are our potter, and all of us are the work of your hand. In fact, take your psalm book out and turn to number uh, 552. Five fifty-two, and I want you to notice uh, the words, uh, the, the words of the song. It actually comes from that passage that I just read. Five fifty-two. Think of the words that we say to God as we sing this song: "Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the Potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after Thy will." while I am waiting, yielded, and still. Look at the last verse. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Hold or my being absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit till all shall see. Christ only, always living in me. This is a song and a prayer of submission to God. Lord, however you make me, however you lead me, whatever you have in store for me, I'm going to be that piece of clay in your hand. Mold me and make me after your will. Now why do I bring all of this up? Maybe you've heard some of those stories too, and I've heard some of the stories, horror stories about when congregation, congregations go through this kind of process, and sometimes it just goes very badly. And uh, uh, sometimes people get angry, sometimes people get hurt, they get their feelings hurt, sometimes people uh, leave over it. And uh, so, but it, but knowing you, I know you guys, and I know that's not going to uh, that's go not going to characterize you. But I do did want to stop and practice just a little bit of discernment here. The question should always be, whatever we're faced with something, especially when we're faced with something 
that doesn't turn out the way that we expected them to. The question should always be, what is God telling me? What is God teaching me in this? Do you believe that God is present here with us today? Do you believe God is present when you leave this building and you go throughout your routine uh, throughout the week? Do you believe that God is actually involved in your life? I'm pretty sure that you do. Otherwise, why would we even pray? Do you believe that God is good? Do you believe that God... Always, that's right. Always. And do you believe that God in His wisdom knows what is best? Of course He does. So the question should always be, what is God telling me? What is God teaching me in this? Now, if I wanted to be a hand and I wanted to be in a foot... Is God saying no? Maybe. God might be saying not now. He may not be saying never. He might, might be saying in the future. Maybe not now. Maybe there's some other way that God wants you to serve right now. Whatever it is, don't let Satan put a negative spin on what is a good thing. Don't become discouraged. Don't become hurt. Remember, God has a plan in a ministry, in a place for us in the body. Every single one of us. God has placed every single one of us in the body just as He desired. And so in whatever way God has called me, whatever way God has called you, it's up to us as that piece of clay in His hand to be faithful in God's calling and we'll experience God's blessing. God is here with us today. Let's pray. Father, we are encouraged by your presence. Father, may we practice discernment. Father, may we always seek your will in humble submission. May we be faithful to your calling. May we love as you love. May we serve as you served. May we look to Jesus as our example. And Father, we want to ask your blessing on us as we continue to move forward. Father, as uh, we practice prayer and discernment. And Father, as we look to who you will choose next to be our shepherds in this body. Father, we thank you for blessing us. Father, so many different ways that you've blessed us here. We see you working in our lives. And Father, we know you will continue to work through us to be your light, to be your body, your hands, your feet, your ears, and your eyes in this community. And Father, we thank you in the name of your Son. Amen. Continue to pray. Continue to pray for the body. We're going to go ahead and sing a song this morning. And if you need to respond to the invitation of the Good Shepherd, Jesus who came and laid down his life for you, was crucified for our sins so that we, we could be reunited with God, who was buried in the grave and rose up from the grave. If you need to accept him as your Lord and you've not done that this morning, if you've not been baptized and born again, if you need to respond, we invite you to come as we stand and sing.